This is Paul again and today I'm going to continue talking about esoteric science and just want to preface that with uh, I'm not a professional mathematician I have some aptitude for it and I did take some courses but over the years I've learned a lot and I listened to a lot of experts and uh, I have some strong interest and experience in esoteric teachings and symbolism and so on so I want to first of all recommend a few little books here because we're going to talk a little bit about math. Math, even though our modern version of math and so on has come down to us in a certain way, there are other ways of looking at mathematical computations that other civilizations got into, and which we'll get into, and I'll talk a little bit about that. The Indian civilization, very ancient India, and Egypt, and so on, and the Mayans, and so on. They There's a lot of ways to calculate things as we all know and one of the ways that we use is we have what's called a base uh, in digital computing it's a base 2 and we have a certain uh, you know two characters a 0 and a 1 that represent a number and if you want to represent a really high number with base 2 you're going to need a lot of digits there but fortunately in computing uh, you know a lot of digits are just little pulses and they can go along at billions of seconds so if you want to make a large number and track something with a digital signature you might say or a digital number like a, a barcode or something um, you know as long as you got a little bit of storage space uh, and there's a lot of numbers out there to calculate so you can have one one number for every little thing that exists basically but anyway, um, the ancient people who talked about mathematics in the esoteric sense were a lot of a lot of the same symbols that we use today. For example, and behind me, I'm going to get into that. We have a little, for example, the the symbol of the sun here. You know, this one here, extremely popular, and you know it goes back a really long way, and is even incorporated into temple designs and all kinds of stuff thing like that here, uh, you know that particular the infinity single uh, si um, symbol, and of course the the plus, which is we you know that symbol crossing is also you know four quadrants is also used tremendously throughout history. So there's a lot of them here, and <clears throat> I'll get into that in a minute. But you know, it, it, all of us are not specialists specialists in mathematics. So what I found in my own personal life is that at least I can get some some basic principles in mind and that's what esoteric science really got down to some of the ancients they make it as simple as possible that's one of the reason that they they use the uh, base uh, the base 60 calculation system imagine how many digits or, or factors are in in 360 you can figure them out yourself but there's one two three four five six I mean you can divide up a certain that number by a lot of different other numbers and you get a lot of the same you know, you can get an integer you might say right for example the ancient system of quickly calculating pi was 22 over 7 which is 3.1428 now that's for building purposes for example if you want to just build something and you don't have to get down to 10 digits of pi to figure out a ratio you see so you could have a couple of, of pieces of string or something like that and in a ratio of 7 and 22 and you know the, all the different things that you could calculate um, in a very simple level using very f relatively simple techniques and ratios you can get some pretty amazing constructions for example the golden ratio 1.618 I believe it is or Phi and then there's a Fibonacci series and so on. So these people from the ancient times incorporated, they were so familiar with this kind of mathematics and spherical geometry that they incorporated them into so many of the buildings that they made that they're standing for, they're standing for thousands of years. So obviously they knew something. Now our modern engineers, we, you know, we, we try to square off everything and we if you you know maybe once in a while they'll build a, a house that's a hexagon or something but usually it's just a square or maybe a cylinder or a box or something and that's how we build stuff these days 
but if you look at the ancient temples, a lot of the ancient temples, every every all their spires were a certain way, and they had rings around the spires, and they were had they had a certain maybe had a little ball at the top of the spire, or maybe they were coated with gold, and you can see that the the engineering is not only the precision of the calculations of the ratios of say a spire, but that's a functional device. When you stick an electrode basically up into the electricity of the the atmosphere you're going to get some some physiological some physical effect and this is a, again you know the pyramids and many other kind of designs like Angkor Wat and there's lots of them around the world but they were functional in a sense of manifesting a physical space in a certain type of geometry now in the ancient system here again we talked about what the ancients said that basically we can't separate our own being as our own deepest consciousness, the root of our own awareness. We can't separate that from what what we are perceiving because the water in our eyes, oxygen and hydrogen, their atoms are vibrating. There's a there's an amazing technology in our body that allows us to have an intermediary perception between matter as you could say you know physical matter but what is it if you get down to it it's just energy it's frequency you see so we have a vehicle and this particular vehicle has some substances in it like water and chemistry and chemicals and those particles and that functionality of that technology which is our body is just a vehicle for the consciousness to be here and manifest and do things and essentially that's what the essence of what's called magic because when you when you couple the intention of our own being with the matter that we're living in the soup that we're living in it's basically for example on a really primitive level you might say we can tonality we can make tones in the body through that resonate through our physical body through our water and through our our bones and so on and cartilage and that sounding of our own body can influence the health of our body and the functionality of our body and this is with a very very ancient techniques and it's the basis of sort of what you call magic because when you when you sown when you sound your own being into a resonance then you can have an effect on the the environment and and on a subliminal level we all do this so it's not magic I mean it, Magic is more of an attention thing when we manipulate forces, and this is for science. The modern science is magic compared to people a long time ago. I mean, just a remote control of about 30, 40, 50 years ago when I was young, if you picked up a little thing and punched some buttons, no, the TV wouldn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. It certainly you couldn't call your friend in China from from your phone. Not very, you know, not outside at least. So there's a a leap in technology because the magic of our own being, our own intuitive awareness, a lot of the great des designs and, and inventions have ultimately come from a dream or some inner dimension of our own awareness or perception that we use the physical body in our brain to bring out and manifest. You see, so the functionality, the ultimate metaphysical science, esoteric science has to do with using your own awareness and integrating it and using focused attention and knowing the laws and the functionality of nature in the various different things. For example, the magnetism is known and the movement of energy is known, polarity is known. Uh, you can feel in your own body, you can feel the energy through your fingers like an electrode. You know, your head has certain resonances you, whenever you speak it goes through your whole brain and it sounds in there and echoes and then you have these ears that are very sensitive and so we our willpower if you just separate I am the I am something I am you don't have to put a label on it just I'm existing I exist I no words necessary in that neutral awareness of no name no identity necessary you just take a look around you, so to speak, and, and feel the energy and feel your body and feel how it functions and everything. Now, we're getting into math here because math really starts with ratios. 
there's a lot of different ways of making a calculation. As I was getting into the number 360, for example, when we still use that system today, even in navigation and so on, because we take a circle and we make a okay. We want to make we want to make calculations of ratios like the sine, the cosine, and so on. We need a functional uh, system of math that will enable us to do that it's because spherical geometry basically if you look at the infinity of infinity uh, on the surface of a sphere there's basically infinity of points okay so essentially what we're talking about is trying to use a symbolic representation of the infinite in the term of a sphere, sphere and we know that geometry, there's geometrical shapes that fit inside a sphere and they all fit in this nesting sphere. So I talked about this before. There's a nesting geometrical ratio, the the, uh, the flower of life symbol, the three-dimensional spheres interacting like bubbles and you see two bubbles merging and they, they, they're interacting on their skin level and somehow they're like, coupled together. This type of principle goes all the way down to the subatomic level. So if you understand one kind of ratio, it, the ratio of pi, for example, goes all the way down to the microcosm. See, it's the ratio is infinite. There's, it doesn't matter what integers of proportion you're using, whether it's a, a macro scale and a million or billion, or when a micro scale or, or nanometers. There's certain ratios and proportions that go from the top to the bottom. If you understand, so math in that sense. The, the internal perception of, of our awareness, all the great mathematicians and scientists also had the calmness of mind. There's a statement in the Upanishad that said all the, the greatness, you know, comes through concentration. Greatness in earth concentration. When we, when you take our willpower, that little will thing that we have, that we don't need to, we don't need to identify with it with anything particular okay just think of it as like this per this point of light and perception that we have that doesn't need to have a whole bunch of baggage with it for the moment to observe the most fragmentary the tiniest and the subtlest things in our existence for example a lot of yogic training and so on or even people who are musicians and so on they're trained to feel the subtle things can you hear that note just precisely enough can you tune that instrument just precisely same way in any kind of science they want to have a microscope or a telescope and they want to get it refined and precise and precise the same way with our own attention that when we allow ourselves to be in a neutral point of view a neutral observation plane with no concepts associated with it, then we are essentially on the micro scale of the cosmos of the we are letting ourselves be nothing. Because at the at the nothingness, if you look at ratios, you go, you know, ten to one, nine to one, you go down, down, down to the like one point one zero 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 over one. When you get to that zero zero over zero zero, the infinity infinity and oneness are basically essentially the same in some senses. That's why the the symbol for for a, a sphere is a circle. It's just have, it represents infinity. You see now another really cosmic amazing thing about this symbol in the middle here is if you think about for example in a three dimensional in the middle of a sphere or in the middle of a circle you start to have like let's say you throw a piece of a pebble into the water in a pond and the pond is completely still. Now you have that one for one fraction of a second, the the thing is in the center, and just as it hits, from then on, another vibration starts happening and goes out into, into concentric circles. Those are observable things from the top to the bottom. So if we use the analogy of mathematics to start thinking, well, if life is... is in our lifetime, in our physical life, we can see flowers and beehives and all these different symbols and different like hexagons and pentagons and things physically manifesting in the things that we see. Then take that up the scale to the like the billions and billions and billions or down all the way to whatever and the frequency range again as above so below so that there is a relationship between the microcosm and the macrocosm and that's a really important thing and the link in there of understanding it because 
if we just look at the, if we just, if a mathematician and scientist for a second just look at yourself in the mirror and say, okay, stop. The, let's try to figure out this consciousness problem because that's the most difficult problem in science from what I've heard. Where does this consciousness come from, you see? But the esoteric scientists looked into that by being in a non a, a non-dual place and observation with no identity. Maybe they had to live in a cave for years to just dump everything, you know, but at some point some wisdom came to us so that, look, the consciousness is the one common thread because even if you're a scientist, you're all day long, you're looking at things, you're analyzing things, but you're not even realizing that who's looking at this stuff? What is that, the nature of that consciousness? Is it just like because there's all kinds of intelligent creatures out there. Some there's some animals and pe that are pretty obviously smarter than most people, <laughs> and nicer too. And they can do all kinds of stuff that we can't do. But when we start really looking at understanding the ancient teaching, this is an old old subject about how consciousness is linked and integrated into our existence and into all matter. So. Yes, there's ways of manipulating energy in a, in a negative way, in a harmful way, you might say, or a destructive way, and we call that black or whatever, okay? When you start obstructing people's will and human will and, and animals' will, then you start getting into darkness. Now, the flowers of life is like the real gift of life, the real, the, the beautiful ratios, the 1.618, uh, all of the phi, I mean, all the, they all have these beautiful, beautiful, beautiful presentations in the cosmos that we can even see on a macro scale in, in the galaxies, in the stars, we can just see it. So think about uh, how that goes all the way down. So if you want to manipulate energy, you want to do some magic uh, on any different plane you might say. I, I think of dimensions as a realm of uh, precision, okay? So if you have a, a dimension in which a certain type of ratios or frequency range you might say and then there's another frequency range higher or lower and that frequency range is related to the one that you're in by ratios but it's it's a different frequency, a higher frequency, might even be a resonant frequency. So dimensions has a lot to do with frequency in my my opinion and you know we know that the higher the frequency the higher the energy so you know ultimately zero and, and the infinite are related because this is basically sort of a symbolic thing our little minds can't comprehend really the infinite that's why we use symbols now let's go through this quickly here <coughs> I talked about the spherical geometry, I talked about the golden ratio, we talked about, well, that, that's a beautiful symbol, the I Ching, prime numbers, Fibonacci, sacred geometry, spirals, cycles, ratios, movement, harmonics, resonance, coupling. These are things, I studied electronics back in the day, and, you know, they, there's a lot of, everything cycle, everything is resonant, there's the whole universe, our bodies being made through frequencies. So. I'll go through a few books here, quickly here, things I reference, I don't always read them mathematically, to, you know, from cover to cover, but I, I reference them sometimes, Theory of Sets, Mathematical Dictionary, these are very helpful for people like me who are not experts in math, but they have really interesting simple diagrams. You see, you know, when we sat in boring algebra class or trigonometry class, we sat and we watched somebody write all these things on the blackboard and we're bored and we wanted to go out and play or whatever, but when you look back at them later, you have a little things under your belt, a little time under your belt, you see, well, it's, it's not that difficult. I mean, it's basically ratios. They use them in art. I mean, there's symbolism, you know, things like this, you know, self-similarity, as I talked about in another book, you know, um, miracle math, you know, there's things that you can do to get more from your knowledge of math, you know, without taking a math degree, like myself, see, you can, you can grasp principles, because ultimately the principles of math are very, very simple, they go, there's a, a self-similarity, as I said, so now here's another book here, I'm going to get into this here, Joy of Mathematics, Mathematics, the Joy of Mathematics, <laughs> with knots. I mean, knots is a whole nother thing. That's, that's really amazing. So if you look at some of the ancient temples and the really 
the Egypt, in Egypt and so on, their their math and their proportion and their geometry was right out there. But we don't know how to read that now because we're our minds are actually not as complex as theirs were. It seems like they knew a lot more than we do in a general sense. At least somebody did. The way they carved everything, and everything is perfect proportion, and they had this whole cosmology going on that was in great detail. You don't learn that in school. So anyway, I don't want to make these videos too long, but I appreciate people liking and sharing, and I know there's some fantastic smart people out there listening to these things, and the stuff that I listen to, I love to share. Uh, again, I'm not a mathematician. I'm an aggregate of information. I combine my own research and esoteric uh, teaching from the past and meditation, personal meditation, and I share what my discoveries are. So thanks again for listening. Goodbye.